Organizations still like to think of themselves as cohesive cultural systems that operate outside of society, where most of their people share common values, where there's respect and tolerance. This is driven by a belief that their people's self-interest in being part of this community is a big driver of motivation and behavior. And secondly, that the organization has selected people with sufficient essential integrity. But as more power has shifted to the individual and our society has become more polarized politically and economically, those assumptions are perhaps not a great starting point in building organizations for the future. In this show, we look at the emerging science of shared intelligence and how groups of diverse minds work and live more effectively together. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender, co-host of the show, along with my friend and leadership expert, Mr. John Gomes. John, how are you feeling today? I am feeling thrilled uh, to be here um, because I have uh, watched our guests work, listened to her, read her work for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years and always really enjoyed it. So I'm very excited about our conversation today. Mm. Scott, how are you feeling? Uh, honestly, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed today. I've been dealing with competing priorities and and uh, so I was feeling a bit distracted, but I'm also feeling um, eager and excited because I love when we have a neuroscientist guest on our show. And uh, so I'm feeling inquisitive, which is probably a good feeling to have when you're a podcast host. So let's get to our questions today. Let's let's introduce our guest if we can. Um, well, actually, do you want to introduce the guest today? Yeah, absolutely. Today, we're joined by the neuroscientist, Dr. Hannah Critchlow. She's best known for demystifying the human brain on her regular radio, TV, festival platforms, and her wonderful books and writing. In 2019, Hannah was named by Nature magazine as one of Cambridge University's rising stars of life sciences. She was recognised as a top 100 UK scientist by the Science Council in 2014 and one of Cambridge University's most inspirational and successful women in science. Hannah, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, John and Scott. I'm delighted to be here with you uh, today. Yeah, welcome to the show, Hannah. How are you feeling today? Oh, I'm very good. I'm feeling quite festive because I have just taken um, a cycle trip up the river with my trailer and bought um, a big fake uh, Christmas tree. Nice. Excellent. Oh, well, I'm glad you're getting in there early. It's just so miserable here at the moment because the weather's turned and it's so dark. So I just, yeah, I think I need to um, bring on the festivities a little bit early in order to cope with it. Yeah, that that sounds good to me. I I think we definitely need that. (laughs) So before we turn to your latest book, can you give us a quick tour of your background? What led you into neuroscience and particularly your passion for public engagement? Um, Yep. So I um, thought I wanted to study medicine and I took um, all science A-levels. And then um, in a year out before I went to university, I actually started working as a nursing assistant in the local psychiatric hospital. And um, so I was largely working with adolescents who had been sectioned, um, so there, they were the, detained there under the Mental Health Act, and this was about 20 years ago. Um, and they had a, you know, a r- wide range of different conditions that they were diagnosed with, but what I found was that firstly, the treatments that were available for them at the time just weren't working. You know, They were really weren't efficacious, and more often than not, they gave r- rise to some really significant side effects. Um, and and I also found out that I really wasn't emotionally tough enough to be mm. um, working on a ward. I just found it very difficult. Um, but I, it, it kind of gave me a real interest in neuroscience and the brain and behavior. Um, and so although I kept going back to the hospital during holidays and for long bank holiday weekends to continue working there, I actually pivoted and decided to study cell and molecular biology instead. And then a PhD in neuropsychiatry, looking at brain connectivity and 
how the architecture of the brain changes in response to learning and memory and how that forms our perception of the world. And then um, that dictates how we navigate the world around us and how we make our decisions. Um, which was, So that PhD was absolutely fascinating. That was at Cambridge University. Um, uh, and although I enjoyed the research and finding out about brain and behavior, I found that a little bit too socially isolating because I spent a, quite a lot of my time in my PhD um, in the basement uh, huh. staring down a microscope. <laughs> and it was right next to the autopsy lab as well. And it was all a bit, uh, you know, oh, man. Oh, <laughs> it was no. <laughs> like going in there long nights and weekends and there was nobody else around right next to the smelly autopsy room. Oh. It was quite it was quite an experience. Yeah. Um, and I, I was rocking by the end of it, actually, uh, <laughs> listening to Radiohead, just looking at these connections in the brain and like learning. It's quite intense. Anyway, so I decided that um, actually what I really wanted was, although I found the brain interesting and I found the research absolutely fascinating and I got a fellowship at Cambridge University, actually, for the last p- year of my PhD, which was, um, which was brilliant. Um, and I enjoyed going to the conferences and discussing all the results with other people and looking at how the research field might move on to help the patients um, with, psych- um, with some of these conditions. Um, what I actually found was that um, I probably wanted to look at more immediate applications for the neuroscience research. And so I went and worked in Oxford University with um, Baroness Susan Greenfield, looking at how neuroscience findings could inform policy. So we organised all party parliamentary groups in Westminster and and demonstrated, you know, kind of discussed some of the neuroscience results that were coming out and discussed them with some of the civil servants and the um, constituent leaders as well within um, Westminster. So, I, so yeah, I, I, and, I, and from there, I really... I just, I really, I developed a real passion actually for um, trying to understand more about the brain and then seeing how we can start to apply those findings, not just just for patients, you know, the children that were um, in the psychiatric hospital, but for all of us, for all of our lives, because, you know, we use our brains all the time, <laughs> you would hope, uh, in different ways. And, you know, it results in our behavior and and it, it results in our interactions and it results in our life trajectory. So mm. neuroscience result, um, findings really have relevance for everybody. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I've done um, kind of uh, radio shows with the BBC um, and with Cambridge University. Um, I've done television work and I've written three books. And my latest book, Joined Up Thinking, is looking at how brains work together. Mm. So my first two books were looking at consciousness and how that develops and how our unique brain cartography, so the architecture of our brain that's a result of our genes that were given from our mum and our dad and a result of the experiences that we have, particularly early on in life, how that results in a very unique individual brain architecture or cartography, which affects how we see the world, how we perceive the world and how we interact with it. Um, so that in some ways there's some kind of destiny, if you like, or fate that's written into our brains because of, because of our biology and the way that our brains are structured. So if we appreciate the fact that we are all unique and there are certain predisposed behaviours that we have, then what's the point of that? Um, and the point of that really is so that when we come together as a group, we can start to balance out any biases, any individual errors in information processing that we, we might have and actually create more intelligence and create a greater, more accurate representation of the world. So there's basically more brain power on offer when our brains come together. So let's hone in on that if we can, because we could take this conversation in so many directions. Your your, your background and is fascinating um, and, and all the work that you've done is, is so rich. Um, but let's let's focus in for the time being on the joined up thinking ideas. Um, particularly, I'm interested. You make this case as you've started to, to to talk about now that if we're going to solve challenges in the world like climate change, for example, we're going to need to expand our thinking about intelligence from being a competition of individual minds to our collective intelligence. So you started talking about mm-hmm. that a little bit. So tell us about collective intelligence. Yeah, so you know we're faced we're faced with a num- number of existential challenges at the moment, from climate change to geopolitical instability, um, to the threat of the next pandemic, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, we need all brains on deck, and we need to be able to work together in order to 
to try and problem solve and horizon scan um, so that we can kind of survive as a species. So it's very important. Um, and because our behavior stems from the brain, neuroscience has quite a lot to tell or show us about how we can more effectively tap in to the cognitive power that's on offer to help our species to thrive and to flourish into the next generations. Um, but then there's also a flip side to our brains as well. So unfortunately, we're, we're, you know, statistically speaking, we're actually more deadly to ourselves than any other species. So um, we've been killing our own species for the last 10,000 years at least. Um, and war alone is estimated to have resulted in something in the region of, I think it's 150 or a billion deaths, um, so, which is a phenomenal number. So actually we're more, you know, statistically speaking, we're actually more deadly to ourselves than the most bloodthirsty shark or crocodile. Mm. So there's a, there's a flip side to our behavior. So we can either achieve great things, you know, creating in, inspirational architecture or artwork or um, making groundbreaking, pioneering medical breakthroughs that really help our species to flourish. Um, but we also have a dark side where, unfortunately, we cause ourselves quite a lot of harm. And since both behaviors really originate from the brain, it makes sense to start to understand how either of those types of behaviors actually emerge and how we can start to nudge our decision making and change our lives so that we can start to make the most of the positive power that's on offer within each of our minds um, and also start to harness the intelligence that's on offer around us. So tapping in to that collective intelligence that's available there in the environment, rather than just getting lost in our own intelligence and, and being competitive, as you said. So in the book, there is a huge amount of really interesting research about how collective intelligence, particularly amongst neurodiverse groups, leads to more creative and novel thought. Can we explore that a little bit, some of that research, but also in the in light of you know, my experience an hour ago being um, on a panel with a thousand people online talking about um, diversity and inclusion in organisations and how polarised that conversation came mm -hmm. very quickly uh, for people who feel devalued of whatever part of the economic cycle they're in um how, how do we make sense of it from a feeling state as well as the the kind of the kind of cognitive rational processes yeah i think there's a few things to consider there so first of all um you know there has been study after study after study that shows that when you get a diverse group of people together um and allow them to communicate freely you increase the intelligence that's on offer and increase the, the potential for innovative problem solving. Um, and so this, this myth of a lone genius working in isolation is really an, an error, it's a myth. It doesn't happen. That's not how intelligence arises. It's a result of an evolution of ideas hopping from mind to mind um, and the ability for us to be able to balance out any errors in our information processing that occur within each of our brains um, by coming together as a group. And so I can, you know, I can talk about a number of studies that show that diversity is the most important. One of the things in the science um, world is, for example, when we, when there's a group that have analysed over 20 million scientific publications that have been published over the last five to 10 years, and they've also analysed over 2.1 million intellectual patents. Um, uh, and what they've discovered from that analysis is that the, the recipe for success, if you like, is bringing together a big group of people that come from different backgrounds in terms of their expertise. So pairing together an anthropologist with a computational scientist, with a linguist, for example. So people that have been trained in different areas um, coming together to contribute their intelligence actually creates more innovative problem solving, uh, which creates higher impact paper in terms of how many times it's cited. So how many times peers in the, um, in the field actually, you know, recommend it or discuss it, but also in terms of its productivity, in terms of how it can be applied to create a patent um, which might impact society. There's also lots of other studies, for example, if you look at um, increasing the number of, again, looking in the STEM world, so the science world, um, 
looking at the number of uh, immigrants working within an American um, workforce, increasing the number of um, people from a different cultural back, back background by just a few percent points actually increases the native wage earn, earners wage capacity by between five and ten percent so it has not just an impact on the uh the new people coming in being able to show uh to kind of um kind of contribute their intelligence that's on offer it has a real world impact on the wages of the people that were originally in that group as well and there's study after study after study that generally that shows this you know that actually being able to tap into people's brains uh, more effectively so people that have got different brains because of their genetic predispositions but also their experiences so their cultural or their socioeconomic status predispositions can actually um, so bringing together a very diverse group actually increases the amount of intelligence that's on offer and increases the amount of innovative problem solving um, potential um, so that you know there's a clear clear arguments for that that have been laid out a number of time number of times you're you're talking um now about um how some people might find accepting that uh quite difficult to to mm. grapple with is that correct yes absolutely so what had the emotional reaction to that um that diversity yeah well first of all i think there's a few things to consider um <clears throat> In terms of, unfortunately, I, I think from our conversation a little bit earlier, you were saying that that maybe the the white middle aged male uh, was were finding it particularly difficult to grapple with this concept concept except that diversity is a positive thing. Is that correct? Yeah, well, not all of them, obviously, but yeah. a, a significant proportion. You know, the, so we had a question which was, um, to what extent do you believe that all human beings are equal? and serve equal opportunity and uh, in a very sophisticated organization 20% mm -hmm. of people said no or it depends which I found staggering <laughs> mm. yeah so what would you what would how would you answer that well I'd say absolutely it's a, it's a, it's a yes I mean you know we're not talking about people who are murderers or psychopaths or anything like that we're talking about the common humanity within this community do they all are they all entitled to equal opportunity that was the question oh the okay yes, yeah so that. i would say i so i would say in, yeah so are they all in, entitled to equal opportunity absolutely yes um but but within that um are they all born equal no i don't think people are no and you can and you can no. see that you know every like genetically and whether when we look at our connectome like the complexity of the fact that we've got something like 3.2 billion base pairs of nucleotides that make up our DNA. Um, and the fact that we've got 86 billion nerve cells that connect up to form this connectome that's in our mind of, you know, 86 trillion connections. So that, that complexity actually offers the ability to have huge amounts of variation and individuality within our species because of the, just by the sheer numbers, right? There's so many different permutations mm. of how they can, these numbers can be, these different genes and these different, um, connections in the brain can be configured, which goes on to have really big impacts in terms of um, our behavior or even, you know, how our eye color or our hair color, for example, or how tall we might be or how, you know, all these different aspects, these physical and um, behavioral aspects that are under um, kind of genetic predisposition uh, and also kind of early years experiences and kind of predisposition. So there's a huge amount of variation within different people. You talk about the genetic predisposition. Was there any research about epigenetics role in this predisposition? Absolutely. So this is what I wanted to get onto next. So first of all, it's, it's appreciating that actually we are born differently. We are all different. And that's why we're successful as a species in some ways. And that, and you know, we really need to start appreciating the way that our human brain has this potential for difference because it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really positive thing that can contribute to much more strength. But 
When we also look at other mechanisms that exist within our brains that help create our behavior, there's a very new field of neuroscience, which is called epigenetics, um, which is looking at how different memories can be stored um, within our brains across generations. So um, it's known that you know you can use your genes, the genes that you're given from your mum and your dad can affect kind of many different attributes from your eye color to your hair color to, you know, how impulsive you might be or um, uh, how prone to addiction you might be, for example, or even how long you might live or how religious you might be. There's lots of different very complex behaviors that are down to our genes. So it's, it's been known for a very long time that, you know, the genes that we're given from our mum and dad go on to affect these types of behaviors. But what we're also finding out is that um, no, it's not just the genes that we're given, but it's also the configuration, the confirmation of those genes, mm. which can be affected affected by traumatic events uh, that our ancestors might have experienced, you know, many, many generations before. Now, the majority of this research, and it is quite an early field of research, the majority of this research has happened in model organisms, but there seem to be parallels in humans as well. Mm. But just to try and explain this concept, um, I'm going to talk about a real you know, pioneering, amazing study that was published in 2014 in, in mice. Um, by this amazing group in America, Kerry Resler's uh, lab. Um, now, so they took some mice, and mice normally love the sweet smell of cherries. Um, and what Kerry and his group did was they paired the sweet smell of cherries with a mild electric shock. And very quickly, the mouse learned through association to start to freeze in anticipation as soon as they smelt the sweet smell of cherries. Um, it, because they were suddenly anticipating. They'd learned to anticipate an electric shock was on its way. So they'd start to contract their muscles to help protect themselves from it. Um, and what Kerry and his group found was that in the sperm, there'd been a change in the shape of the DNA of the grandfather's sperm that basically um, changed the, the way that, that the genes were expressed. And that difference in genes expression, because enzymes couldn't those genes quite as effectively anymore. Um, so that difference in gene expression actually caused the nerves to be re-rerouted from the olfactory bull by the nose, basically, um, and leading it instead to the front, instead of to the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure region of the brain, which would have made the little mouse kind of get excited as soon as it smelt the sweet smell of cherry and start scurrying around and being really motivated to try and hunt out this sweet treat. Instead, that change in the conformation in the grandfather's sperm actually resulted in the nerve cells um, kind of being rerouted to go to the amygdala, which is the region of the brain that's involved in the fear response, so that they would be more um, kind of freezing up in anticipation of an electric shock coming. Now, what Kerry found was that this epigenetic change actually didn't just affect the children of these original pups in the study, it also affected the grandchildren. So this epigenetic change in the shape of the DNA was being transmitted across generations to affect behavior. And what he did was he, you know, he just double checked um, by kind of doing some IVF and fostering out some of the pups to make sure that they, the mice weren't kind of communicating this threat in the environment, that it actually was a biologically ingrained mechanism that ensured that Things could be learnt, associations could be learnt, and traumatic memories could be learnt and passed on across generations. And he found that actually that's indeed the case, that it was a biological mechanism. It was a change in the sperm of the grandfather. And presumably, you know, perhaps a similar mechanism exists in the grandmother's oocytes as well, the eggs. Um, so this, when this finding, when it was published, was um, it really left the neuroscience community reeling because the implications of it are quite large. Mm -hmm. um, Studies after that have found that um, in worms, C. elegans, another model organism, you can actually transmit memories like this across not just one or two generations, but actually 14 wow. generations. 
So we're talking about a model organism, a little earthworm, right? It's got a very simple nervous system yeah. that has these types of mechanisms in it that can allow memories to be stored and transmitted. And not just stored and transmitted, but modified, changed by experiences and then transmitted across multiple, multiple generations. And when we look in human studies, there's some compelling um, work that's coming out looking at how, for example, descendants of the Holocaust have changes in um, the epigenetic, so the conformation, the shape of the gene that's involved in the cortisol response, which is the stress response. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, there's many epigenetic, and there's also some interesting work that's come out of SOS villages in Lahore, in Pakistan, looking at how some of the children and their descendants have been affected via these epigenetic routes as a result of the trauma that they may have been exposed to, particularly during early years. So it seems, I mean, and I'm going to stress, you know, again, that, you know, this first study was coming out in 2014. So, it's, you know, that wasn't that that long mm. ago in terms of science. But it's, you know, mm. it's a growing field of research and it has huge implications for how we look at how we treat each other, mm. you know, mm. and how effects can be really transmitted across many generations to affect how they also perceive other people. It's fascinating. Um, so, but then also there's another thing, which is, you know, at, when we talk to other people, when we, when we communicate and kind of work with other people, which we have to do in, you know, our work life, but also in our, you know, family life as well and our friendship lives, um, because of the way that our brains work and the way that we... You you were saying earlier, Scott, that you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. So it's not a surprise, actually, because we're all overwhelmed, actually, all the time. So something in the region of 11 billion bytes of data per second enter our senses. And our brain has to try and make sense of that every second. 11 billion bytes of data is a phenomenal amount. But we're actually only consciously aware of something in the region of 40 to 50 bytes per second, which is a minuscule proportion. So quite a lot of that information is just not made consciously aware of by our brains. And a lot of shortcuts occur within our brains. We take we make assumptions in our thinking, which is based again on the genes that we've been given from our mum and dad, but also as a result of our early years experiences that help to create these kind of shortcuts in our brain in terms of this information processing and that's kind of to help us not feel so overwhelmed at times um but because of that because of the way that our brains can so quickly process information and come to some idea of reality even if it's a little bit inaccurate because we take all these shortcuts and information processing right because of that we've actually all got a slightly unique take on the world because we each process information in a different way, taking different shortcuts as a result of the experiences that we've had. And so when we start to share our ideas and share our perception of the world with people, especially people that have had different genetic backgrounds and different experiences to us, we realize that they're taking different shortcuts. Mm. They're coming up with a completely different semblance of reality. Mm -hmm. And it can be quite confrontational. It can be quite jarring to talk to people when they totally get have a different different idea to you but there's some groundbreaking work that's come out of um chris frith and uta frith's lab in university college london that shows that you know unequivocally when we start to share our version of reality with other people both of us will start to get to a more accurate version of reality Hmm. so even though it can be quite uncomfortable to do this because you know also it takes some mental gymnastic work it can requires you know a little bit of different shift a shift in the way that we think which actually also requires some kind of we've got to start to create new connections in the mind so it requires actually some new construction work in your neural pathways in your brain so it's, it's quite energy consuming to do this but um but by talking to a, to other people you can get a more rep accurate representation of the world and so obviously you can more innovatively problem solve as well because also can people have got you know different ideas different ways of looking at things that they can start to um talk about how that can impact how they can problem solve um but there's also um this idea that because in some ways because we've got access to information in from the world around us all the time on our phones on our smartphones and because in some ways 
you know, we may be starting to live slightly more insular lives. So apparently we're living during a loneliness epidemic Mm -hmm. where people are less likely to form bonds um, with people that are outside their normal kind of um, existence. Um, and they're starting to feel quite lonely. Um, there's this idea that actually as a result of this, the fact that we're having less interactions with random people, um, because we're relying more and more on the information that's stored within our phones, that creates a bit of certainty mm. because there's a lot of structural information there. You know, mm-hmm. you know how to navigate the world because your smartphone tells you how to. So you know, you know that you know how to do it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, your, and so your brain gets used to that certainty. It gets used to the fact that you can look up when something is going to open and having all this, inf- like a shop's going to open or a restaurant's going to open and what food is going to be available there. And so you'll get, you'll, you'll, your brain is kind of starting to get used to this um, certainty in the world, possibly as a result of the, t- the te- technology. Um, and so, but actually kind of, Discussing ideas and discussing viewpoints with other people requires quite a lot of acceptance for ambiguity and to have a high tolerance for uncertainty. So when, for example, somebody is coming to you saying, uh, you know, neurodiversity is a good thing, we should all be kind of, um, you know, equal, have equal opportunities. And there's a, there's sound scientific reasons for this. You know, somebody might find that quite confronting because they didn't don't have that per- perception of the world because they've been brought up in a completely different, you know, structure. They've had very different experiences and they might not, you know, they might struggle to do all the widespread kind of um, con- reconstruction work uh, that will help update their sense of reality to make it more accurate. And it can be quite difficult to do that. So there's some lovely little games that we can all do to help boost our tolerance for uncertainty, to make interacting with other people, um, you know, that might have different views of the world, might have different ways of looking at things, um, to might start making that a little bit easier, if that makes sense. I, I would like to hear more about that because it seems to me we're living in a world where there's a lower tolerance for ambiguity and diverse perspectives than maybe ever before. And that might just be my U.S. centric perspective looking at the sort of political landscape and whatnot but i i see a lot of that and so i'd love to to hone in on that a little bit more yeah yeah exactly so it's i mean it's interesting isn't it because we've been driven to develop all of these technologies whether it's transportation technologies or communication technologies like social media that allow us to travel across the globe and share our perspective like never before and you know all of these amazing developments that have come along in part spurred on by the pandemic you know, Zoom, for example, or Teams calls, or the technology where we're having this conversation, where I'm sat in Cambridge and you're in America, we're able to have these conversations um, because of these technological developments that are allowing us to share our different perspectives and our different expertise, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's interesting that we're, as a species, we have been compelled to create all of these different technologies, which basically help to boost our collective intelligence. But there is, you know, there is going to be a bit of a backlash against that because also it's quite confronting to have to um, listen to people that have a different sense of reality to, to you. So there's a bit of a balance going on within the brain. So what can we do in order to make the most of the technology that's available that helps us to increase our collective intelligence without it leading to a downfall of our collective intelligence because of, you know, really negative tribal tendencies. And also because our brain just isn't prepared to do the work Mm. to reconstruct its sense of reality. It finds it too jarring, too confronting to um, take on board other perspectives. Well, um, so Leila Mofrad, she's based at Newcastle uh, University. She's working, I mean, actually going back to adolescents. She's working largely with adolescents that have been um, diagnosed with different conditions um, to do with mental health. And she's looking at tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity um, for them. But she's been advocating lots of group work, so group discussion work and playing games like even really simple things like Jenga where you, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And actually, there's no real proper reason for it. But you're just, you know, you're just having a play with lots of other people. And you just, you start to do more and more of those things of playing with other people um, in and, and incorporating that into your life. And, and she also says things like, you know, maybe we should 
try new restaurants all the time, really push ourselves just in those really simple ways mm. on a day-to-day -day, um, level. Or maybe um, go to a new place, a new city, a new country, and just don't don't take your um, smartphone with you. Don't have Google Maps with you. Just go and get lost. Go and enjoy getting lost. And I remember when I was a, you know, a student and I was 18 going into railing and comp like this is, you know, before there was Google Maps and all we had was like a Lonely Planet guide. But most of the time I'd, I loved not having the Lonely Planet in my pocket and just enjoy getting immersed in being completely lost and enjoy that uncertainty of not knowing what's coming. So it's something that I think we all need to start working on a little bit more yeah. so that we can start to interact with each other and accept that uncertainty and that ambiguity that comes from interaction as well. And just and you were talking earlier about having curiosity rather than, you know, skepticism or kind of um, and having being inquisitive rather than being feeling overwhelmed. And that's exactly it is shifting your your um, your kind of your mindset uh, so that you are feeling more curious and more inquisitive and have more resilience as well uh, to be able to cope with that uncertainty. But there's, yeah, so as I talk about in the book, there's some really fascinating neuroscience that underpins all of this. So a bit of play before we start getting into business might be helpful. You, you talk about... Um, synchronization of brainwaves amongst groups helping with collective intelligence and the importance of their emotional state in this regard can you tell us a little bit about that oh yeah so there's some lovely work that's come out of i mean i first heard about it from vicky leong's lab she's based in singapore um and she's been she's been she initially started studying this um actually in parents and children so she'd hook the parents and the child like a less than a one-year-old baby up to an EEG, so they'd be measuring the electrical oscillations going across the baby's brain and the parent's brain as well. Um, and these electrical oscillations are basically created because the eight to six billion nerve cells that I talked about earlier, um, they have, these nerve cells have these kind of sodium and potassium pores that are studded into their membrane. And basically um, the reason that your brain needs so much energy and also because it takes so many shortcuts because it is... Uh, kind of, you know, very energy, uh, like what it does uses a lot of energy. The reason for that is because it basically pumps sodium and potassium ions in and out of those nerve cell membranes all the time. And because the sodium and potassium ions are charged, that creates an electric current, uh, which zips across the nerve cell and goes to the next nerve cell in the circuit. Um, and these electrical oscillations kind of um, kind of zip across these circuits, these very individual circuits that we each have in our brain um, to create thought and to create emotions and behavior. And what Vicky found is that, um, so, so first of all, it's really important to think about the fact that the way that our brain perceives information or takes in information from the outside world isn't actually as a continuous video reel. It's actually like time shots of information, little time stamps of information. And then your brain seamlessly stitches it all together, bringing in information from your eyes, your ears, your sense of touch, your sense of balance, your sense of smell, for example, bringing in those little bits of information and stitching it together to create a continuous video reel. But actually, so, so although you see it as a continuous video reel where everything is seamlessly mashed together, actually what's happening is your senses are doing this phenomenal job of creating the movement of these sodium and potassium ions whizzing across your brain to take that those snapshots of information, those photos of information, if you like, and bring it together to create your seamless sense of reality. So what Vicky found is that actually when she looked via the EEG, looking at the electric kind of oscillations across the brain in the parent and the child, what she found is that they started to become in step or synchronized with each other, particularly when the parent and the child were learning from each other. They were properly learning. Um, and what she found is that this brain synchronicity and these there's been other studies in different groups of people, in older groups of people. What they can see is that brain synchronicity is basically linked to um, consensus building and problem solving within a group. 
So the mm. more the individual's brains are becoming synchronized and oscillating in step with each other for the individual members within a group, the better the chance is that that group will be working effectively together, building consensus and being able to innovatively problem solve uh, as a group. And there's different things that you can do, Vicky found, and other groups have found, in order to try and boost that brain synchronicity. Um, so, for example, direct eye contact uh, has been linked to increased learning and increased brain synchronicity. Mm. Um, and there's also been things like um, exercise is thought to play a role. Um, and even singing helps to boost brain synchronicity, for example. Really? Uh, yeah. So, there's, so you know, these, these things of, you know, going for it. So when I was um, working in the lab, I'd kind of everyone in the, I have to say everyone in the department was feeling a bit you know we're all a bit grumpy and the team wasn't working, working very well at some point so I did instigate a lunchtime running session to kind of get everyone else out running together thinking maybe this will boost the brain synchronicity I can't sing I'm, te- I'm a terrible musician so I didn't like start doing a choir <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so when I go to meetings and talk about some of these findings, I'll try and do things like, you know, get everybody to go for a swimming session if there's a swimming pool there or, you know, go for a run or do some exercise together or there's yeah different different things that we can do together to try and help boost brain synchronicity to help people literally start to see the world in in the same timestamp so that they're more likely to be able to learn from each other. Um, what Vicky's also found is that actually um, mood uh helps um it, or impacts on the potential for brain synchronicity so if the parent was in a low mood not feeling very well at all then uh learning from the ch- with the child and brain synchronicity was hampered really so it's really important mm. that we have you know have a think about how our emotional state really affects not just us Mm. but other people as well Mm -hmm. you know so we've got you know we really need to look after our emotional state and other people's emotional states um to make the most of our intelligence and their intelligence (laughs) Yeah. yeah if you're enjoying the evolving leader please head over to apple podcasts and leave us a review and don't forget to follow along on instagram and linkedin you can find us at evolving leader thank you for listening now Let's get back to the show. So you talk about um, listening a lot in fostering creative uh, intelligence or collective intelligence rather. And you suggest a game that families can play to get better at it. Um, So that's a a great place to develop this life skill. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's some lovely work that's come out of Thomas Malone and Anita Wooler's labs in America. And what they found is that if you look at a group, and this is studies from hundreds and hundreds of different people, um, looking at many different studies, looking at groups working together, and they were looking at what the number one predicting factor could be for how successful a group is at solving problems and working together. And they found that it isn't the individual IQ scores of the individual members that make up that group. Um, So it's not that. Um, What it is, is actually gender ratio. So the higher the number of females in the group, the more successful that group would be at problem solving uh, and and, um, kind of reaching the goal of the the complex problem that had been set for the group. Um, And it's thought that, you know, that's not because males are just, you know, a bit thick um, it's just, it's more that um, <laughs> females are generally better at turn taking and listening, so they're better able to allow the intelligence that's on offer within that group to be contributed to the group, so that you can access and harness it a little bit more effectively. Um, and so, you know, and this ties in with a lot of research that shows that basically we all of us, you know, not just males, um, but we really need to get better at listening to other people. Um, because, you know, other people have got intelligence available to us that, you know, might have a positive impact on our lives. Mm. And it's something that we can start to, you know, um, kind of actively integrate into our lives, not just in board meetings, but also with friends, you know, asking the question, how are you doing? How was your day? And letting them talk, maybe for two or three minutes. Don't interrupt. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to fill silence or we have to fill a conversation with our voice actually no we don't sometimes but you're obviously very good at this (laughs) but you know sometimes it's 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 listening 
We can get lots of information there. And it can be very uncomfortable to do at the beginning. So um, so I talk about different exercises of doing this with friends or with colleagues, you know, sitting down and and having um, asking a question and then just listening to the answer, accepting the answer and letting them find the space to actually explore that answer um, and contribute a little bit more. And, and playing this with children as well, you know, your children at home or your grandchildren or your cousins or your nephews, um, you know, asking them about their day and then just giving them space. They might not be interested in talking about their day, but asking them <laughs> to kind of, you know, come up, come up with some kind of story about a horse and then just not, not actually responding much to them but just listening just sitting and listening um yeah and it's, so there's an exercise within the book that can help us to do this speaking of spaces you talk about sitting in silence at the start of a meeting uh can you can you share about that yeah, yeah. so i mean this is a um this is you know a practice that I, it's amazon leader jeff i can never pronounce his name Bezos. It's a bit Bezos, Bezos, yeah. um apparently instills in his meeting so it's again it's so that, you know, they have uh, a document that they've got to read and then they sit in silence. So instead of trying to jump in and the most dominant person um, offering up their viewpoints first, which could create a clone like echo chamber mm-hmm. of thought, because everyone then follows the most dominant person's um, kind of takings or the most extroverted person's contributions. Right. So instead, just sitting there for a minute to digest that material and to think about what you actually want to respond to it and then when it's time for people to speak the most junior person within the group actually speaks first um so that you don't you're less likely to get that dominance dynamic effect that can lead to less ideas being generated and less intelligence that's being available because other people might just be falling in step with the most dominant person's thoughts yeah, that makes a lot of sense. With all the, the pressure-facing teams and all this uncertainty that we're, we're currently in, there was a, a thing published today, the uh, the World Uncertainty Index, um, with this bar chart showing <laughs> huge uncertainty fluctuations that are ticking upwards. Um, something you know our brains don't like. You talk about the need to cultivate curiosity rather than fear mm. in that environment. What advice have you got for us to, to kind of help achieve that? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? It is difficult. And there is a huge amount of, you Mm. know, whilst we have got a lot of certainty on our phones in some aspects of our lives, there's a huge amount, you know, and partly as a result of these communication technologies and because of the way that everything's become so much more fast paced, there is also a huge amount of uncertainty and potential (laughs) a real big change looming on the horizon. Um, And our brains have got to compute that. They've got to be able to cope with it in order to think, you know, and... um, there's, I think there's some people that are more predisposed to be, a, to be able to cope with that. I think that's the first thing to appreciate. So the region of the brain that's involved in the fear response and thinking about the here and the now and threat appraisal for the here and now is, as I mentioned earlier, the amygdala. And that's got to be in balance with another circuit within the brain, which is further towards the forehead. Um, and that's called the anterior cingulate cortex. And that's the brain region that's involved in monitoring um, kind of horizon scanning and looking to collaborate with others and problem solve into the future. And these two different brain regions can be more sensitive within different types of people. Um, and they can also become out of check So you could have a situation where you're feeling so threatened that actually your amygdala is in hyperdrive at the expense of your anterior cingulate cortex. So then you're less open to like being able to tolerate uncertainty and ambiguity and you're less capable of horizon scanning and problem solving into the future and forming collaborations. Um, So what we really need to do is to make sure that we try and keep our amygdala down in activity um and so you know stress management is a good way of doing that hmm. and, and be just being aware that these different brain circuits are in, are operating in balance and if you're in an environment that is making you your, your amygdala become hyperactive then you know that's because your brain's telling you you need to get out of it or you need to stop um allowing that stimuli to a- access your brain because it's not it's not helping your brain problem solve into the future so on the evolving leader, we're really interested in the growing understanding about embodied knowledge, such as interoception. Um, what have you come to understand 
about this in the context of social intelligence? Oh, yeah. So there's some lovely work um, that has, you know, that first really piqued my interest when I met this guy called John Coates. And he was a trader on the uh, kind of Wall Street stock floor. And he was very successful. And so he looked around him on the floor and he just thought, you know, what is it about me that makes me so financially rich <laughs> compared to some other people? <laughs> and he, you know, he had a hunch of an idea. And so what he did is he went and retrained um, in neuroscience, which is where I met him at Cambridge University. So he was working at the Judge Business School there. And what he found in an admittedly small scale study is that those traders that were operating, um, particularly during a period of economic downturn, um, actually had greater profits. They were much more successful if they were better at detecting their heartbeat, mm. which sounds like a bit of a weird thing. But um, so uh, going back to this idea that there's 11 billion bytes of data uh, that's in the environment around us, and we're only consciously aware, aware of about 40 to 50 bytes per second, you know, there's a huge amount of information from the outside world and from other people that's subconsciously stored within our peripheral nervous system. So the nerves that are in our body, and there's a huge amount of nerves that's in our heart or in our gut. And that's why, you know, you, you probably experienced having a gut feeling or a heart flicker mm -hmm. uh, in response to different kind of um, things that are going on in the environment. And that can impact on your decision making. Well, you know, there's a lot of those nerve cells that are storing intelligence from other people within our heart. And we detect that information from the heart and from the gut via this cable of nerves called, called the vagus nerve. And what John found is that these very successful um, kind of financial people working on Wall Street actually had a more sensitive vagal nerve activity and were better able to detect their heartbeat. And that this actually predicted their profits that they made, this ability to detect their heartbeat so but actually predicted the profits that they made particularly during a period of economic downturn yeah so it's re you know really interesting so being able to just you know tap into that intelligence that's on offer around us by listening to our bodies a little bit more mm. not just being led by our heads but also being led by our hearts and our guts uh, so that we can start to soak up some of the information that's in the environment around us is really important. But it's also important to keep that um, kind of vagal nerve activity in balance as well. So again, it's got to be in balance. So you can't just um, be listening and tapping into the intelligence that's around us. But um, Sarah Garfinkel, she's a professor at University College London, and she's been looking at different ways that we could, might be able to maybe all keep our vagal nerve and our kind of interceptive ability, it's called, in check uh, and operating in a positive way so that we can tap into the intelligence that's around us. Um, and so she's been working on doing heartbeat detection tests. Mm. So, for example, just each of us spending a bit of time each day listening to our heartbeat, just checking into it. And if it's difficult to do that, because I sometimes actually struggle, and I'm not very rich, but probably linked, you know, <laughs> but I sometimes struggle to uh, like listen to my heartbeat. So if I just then get up and do a few star jumps so that my heart's beating a little bit faster and, re and then I can, you know, sit down and spend some time listening to my heartbeat. So again, getting my brain used to listening to that information that yeah. is being stored in the body from the collective intelligence that's out there in the world. we come nearer to the end of our time can we zoom out and just think about how you might envisage our collective intelligence developing over time with the advances and technology that that are out there i'm thinking you know the, the metaverse and other things that continue this process of us living in this digital environment yeah i mean well this is kind of almost really why i also wrote the book um, because there's huge advances in neuroengineering and it's really interesting, isn't it, that 
huge amounts of money are being pumped into neuroengineering developments. So, you know, mm. the I, these guys that we think of as the lone geniuses working by themselves, like Zuckerberg or Elon Musk, they're putting a huge amount of investment money in being able to better tap into the collective intelligence that's on offer, whether it's through Meta, whether it's, you know, or whether it's so um, Zuckerberg actually published a paper recently. He's doing quite a lot of collaborations with different uh, kind of scientific groups looking at telepathy. Um, and then Elon Musk is uh, kind of working on Neuralink, uh, a company that he's set up where, again, he's investing huge, huge amounts of money um, to try and look at brain machine interfaces and seeing how we can start to, you know, possibly work with artificial intelligence to create more of a brain cloud that, you know, that could harness our collective intelligence a little bit more effectively. But it's not just Zuckerberg and Musk that are working on this. It's actually neuroengineers that are working across the globe and they've had, you know, significant advancements that have been slightly less publicized because they're slightly low profile scientists. But just as an example, these are some of the, you know, to me, mind blowing uh, kind of results. So, for example, did you know that you can now take the electrical oscillations, the electrical signature of a memory from a donor brain, imprint it onto a recipient's brain, and that recipient's brain will learn that thing from the memory a little bit faster. Wow. So it's actually helping, aiding the facilitation, the transmission of memories from one brain to another. Now, that work was actually in rodents, obviously, model organisms rather than humans. But there's also been the creation of human brain nets where we're creating a group of people that are not communicating through any means other than electrical oscillations. So taking, picking up the electrical signatures from one brain and then transducing them using magnetic stimuli to a second person's brain. And this groups of people can use this electrical magnetic kind of communication in order to play games with each other and solve um, 20 questions. <laughs> So pretty simple things at the moment, but you know, there, but there's been progress working on them. Mm. What else? There's been some, so that's brain net kind of work, but then what else has there been? Oh, the idea, there's been some lovely work looking at how emotions can be contagiously transferred. So alpha waves, which is a kind of slow rhythmical electrical oscillation, one of the slowest forms of awake oscillations in the brain, in the human brain, um, that's associated with more calm, creative thought. And um, there's been some really interesting work where you can contagiously transmit alpha waves from one brain to another. Again, just using electrical stimuli and then different sensory inputs. So there's, yes, yeah, really fun demonstrate. There are more artistic demonstrations looking at that. Um, but, you know, these types of developments really pose the question, you know, would we be able to one day create a, almost an organic computer that could pose and maybe even answer questions that we can't look at or solve in binary form. So it's really looking at how we might one day meld our minds with artificial intelligence and meld mm. our minds through neuroengineering developments with each other so that we can start to make better use or more use of the collective intelligence that's on offer. That's on offer. So, I mean, some of these is a bit too sci science fiction and dystopian, and they raise quite a lot of, you know, really profound ethical issues and privacy issues and intellectual property issues. But the technologies are being developed. There's a huge amount of money that's that are, that's being invested in this area. So I think as a society, we will also want to have a think about, you know, where we want to be headed. <laughs> right. And maybe, and maybe we just need to, you know, listen to each other a little bit more and do some star jumps, listen to a heartbeat. <laughs> Maybe that's like that's a slightly less terrifying view for our species progression. I don't know. <laughs> it's great advice. It's great advice. Yeah, definitely up for that. Yeah, yeah but just, yeah, you know, do some singing that. together, running together, and um, listening to our heartbeats. Maybe it's a bit easier than, yeah. Well, shall we all sing up. a song together right now? I th oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, no, 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 please don't do that. <laughs> Oh dear. I think Scott can sing. I think mm. he, he, mm. he's uh, he's just angling for an opportunity. But um, just found my we're in. Not, we're not going to do a three part <laughs> harmony here. So Hannah, what, what's next for you in in the coming year? That's a good question. Um, so I've just been you know going on doing quite a lot of talks t to lots of different businesses um, and sectors. So um, I've been speaking with civil servants in Westminster. Um, on some of these findings on collective intelligence. Um, I've been invited to go and give a talk with the Ministry of Defence. I've also been talking with um, leaders that are working in the energy fields 
um, because they, you know, obviously appreciate that there needs to be quite a lot of mental gymnastics and pivoting in light of, you know, what's happening with the world. Um, and so they need to better access some of the collective intelligence on offer there so that they can kind of innovate. Um, uh, and I've also been talking to um, many people that work in the financial world because obviously the implications um, in terms of, you know, certainty and all the changes that are occurring, uh, the results from neuroscience have implications for those audiences. So I'll, I'll be continuing to do quite a lot of that. And then the paperback is out uh, of this book um in may yep but what i really need to do so i'll be continuing doing quite a lot of discussion uh and working with different groups and creating workshops for example tailored workshops for different um businesses uh to help implement some of these neuroscience findings into companies day-to-day -day running uh, and to help you know, maximize the brain power that's on offer. Excellent. Well, we look forward yeah. to that because um, I, I, I think one of the things that um, I'd encourage our listeners to uh, to do is to go and, and, and take a look at Hannah's work because it's incredibly um, accessible and very personal. You 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 tell the the story of this research and your your um, journey through it from a very personal perspective and and from the life that you lead and you know bring it your daughter and, and it, it's very easy to to kind of inhabit your world so i really enjoyed that mm -hmm. experience and i think other people will get a lot from it thank you hannah this hour just flew by for me i wish we had hours more to talk to you because i feel like we could just i could listen to you for hours so thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing some of your brilliant insights and for our listeners, remember, the world is evolving. Are you? Are you?